join us. But Mark uh, will make a presentation to, Lynn, uh, to Lisa and Anil at a, at a future time. And what I'd like to do at some point when we're all back together as, um, as uh, not virtually meeting, but actually meeting, is that we invite all those people who've been given Paul Harris Fellows virtually through Zoom to a meeting where we can once again congratulate them on being Paul Harris Fellows. Uh, Marcy is because of gifts like the ones your parents made in your in Lisa's and Nils in your honor that the Rotary Foundation is able to carry out an array of programs that achieve beneficial changes in our world, improving living conditions, increasing food production, better education, mm -hmm. wider availability of treatment and rehabilitation for the sick and disabled, and new channels for the flow of international understanding and brighter hopes for peace. A contribution to the Rotary Foundation is an investment in the ideal of goodwill, peace, and understanding. It is an ideal held high by Rotarians the world over and one that each of you clearly shares. Marcy, on behalf of the trustees of the Rotary Foundation and on behalf of the members of the Rotary Club of Westwood Village, it gives me great pleasure to present to you through Zoom the emblems and appreciation given to a Paul Harris fellow. I believe your father already has those. So Mark, if you would like to give the uh, certificate to, to Marcy oh. and as well as her Paul Harris fellow, that'd be great. And I'd like to read what the certificate actually says. It says the Rotary Foundation of, the Ro of, Rotary, Interna of Rotary International, Marcy Rogo is hereby named a Paul Harris fellow in appreciation of tangible and significant assistance given for the furtherance of better understanding and friend, friendly relations among the peoples of the world. So let's, uh, let's all congratulate Marcy, as well as her sister Le Lisa, and her husband Anil as they become Paul Harris Fellows. Congratulations. Thank you. So um, Mark and Lynn, I think it's great that you guys have have uh, designated your daughters and son-in-law to be Paul Harris Fellow. Uh, I think more of us should be considering that. Some of us have. My two sons are both Paul Harris Fellows. I wish I said I did it, but I didn't. My father-in-law, as you all know, Ray Zickville, actually, and my mother-in-law were the ones who did it. So hopefully more of you will. Mark, do you have anything you want to say, share with the members about making gifts no. to, the Paul Harris, to the foundation at this point? I know you're involved in Rotary Matters when dealing with the foundation at the district level. I do, and, and most of you know this, that the money that we donate to the Rotary Foundation comes back to us three years later in the form of global gift grants, matching grant money. Um, and I have traveled to over 45 of the clubs in the last two years as the global grant sub chair, advocating uh, a reversal of the declining trend towards giving to the foundation. And I'm you know, and I'm trying to set the example, um, and um, I'm hoping that everybody else will will consider putting the foundation as a higher priority in your annual giving, because um, we are the district that is known so well in, um, uh, at the Rotary headquarters as the district that does the global grants, uh, so involved in them. But, we, but we've had declining giving in the last six years, and... Um, uh, you know, it'd be wonderful to reverse that, to be able to do more in the world. Only Rotary gives you that incredible opportunity to make a donation and then it comes back three years later to make it again. Um, so I would say to all of you, uh, please consider Rotary Foundation as uh, a priority in your giving. Um, please consider increasing your giving this year and consider making your children um, uh, a Paul Harris fellow, not only as a way of giving to the foundation, but also as a way of introducing them to the wonderful world of Rotary. Um, so, uh, you know, Steve, thank you for the opportunity and letting me soapbox this, but it's near and dear to my heart and everybody knows how I feel about Rotary and what it does throughout the world. Thank you. You're, you're welcome, Mark. You're very generous. You and Lynn have given so much to Rotary, you, you specifically give your treasure, your time and your expertise. You're a, you're a true Rotarian. I think a future Paul, I think a future district governor would be in order. <laughs> Lynn, they want you to be <laughs> <a> district governor. 
<laughs> oh, that's Thank you. wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Steve. And now I will turn the program over to Tom, who will introduce our speaker. Thank you, uh, Nancy. Uh, it's my privilege, actually, to uh, introduce my good friend, Dr. James Saltz. Uh, Jim attended Ohio Wesleyan University, where he got his uh, bachelor's degree, and then went on to Duke University to get his master's of a doctorate. And uh, then came out to California, where he did residency and, and his internship at USC for ophthalmology. Uh, Dr. Saltz uh, has a kind of a problem because he roots for Duke in basketball season, then he roots for USC in football season. So I can't pin him down, <laughs> but, he, but Jim, here's a UCLA hat just to keep you honest for a while. But anyway, Jim's a good friend and he's, his biography goes on for a long deal. He's had so many accomplishments. Uh, he's a member of the uh, media spokesman unit for the American Academy of Ophthalmology. He's uh, received numerous awards and some of his accomplishments, he's uh, uh, received, um, uh, let's see here, I'm looking at it, uh, in November, he was a recipient of the annual prestigious International Society of Refractive Surgery, Bakura Award, honoring his contributions to refractive surgery. In 1997, he received the Academy, American Academy of Ophthalmology, which has honored Jim Saltz with the Senior Honor Award in 1997 and the American Academy Lifetime Achievement Award in 2003 for his continuing contributions to refractive surgery. He's a editor of several books, numerous articles, and a founding editor of the Journal of Refractive Surgery. Uh, this goes on and on, and I could spend most of the time, but we don't want to hear from me. We want to hear from uh, <laughs> Dr. Saltz uh, about uh, the eye problems of the elderly. And um, certainly he's worked on my eyes, and believe me, I wouldn't let anybody work on my eyes unless I had total trust in him. Jim Saltz, you're up. Hey, Tom, thank you very much for the kind introduction. Um, I just want to make one thing very clear. I love the Bruins because when I had my gallbladder taken out, they saved my life about two years ago. So. <laughs> uh, UCLA has a fond, 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 fondness for, for me in my heart because if I would have been traveling, I probably would have been dead. They did my gallbladder surgery on the day after Father's Day three years ago, and I'm still going strong. Am I able to, to do the screen sharing now? Yes, uh, I will shut this down. Let's see, you have to give me, there we go. Let's see if I can do this now. It says the host has disabled, disabled screen sharing, so we have to enable screen sharing. Well, that you know that's weird because I had set it up so that anybody could share, and somehow that got. And try it again. We'll see if I have the PowerPoint ready to go. If I'm permitted. Dr. Salt's a co-host, and then he can share. Okay, I was Should trying to okay? save. I was trying to save you that hassle. <laughs> Let's see, here you are in the list. Make host. Okay, I'll make you host for now. And then and then we can switch back. It's okay now. Yeah, my computer is saying Jim Saltz is now the co-host. It's now the host. Okay, let's see if I can get it up now. Whoa. One participant can share at a time. Let's see. Okay, here we go. I think we got it now. We got it. Yay. Okay, let's see if I can do this right now. Everybody can see that okay? Yes. Okay, so uh, this is what we're gonna talk about. Uh, most of you members are probably over 50 years old. Is that a face, fair statement? Yep, not all, but most. Most, okay, so we're gonna talk about external eye problems. The leading cause of poor vision as we get older is macular degeneration of the retina. And then after that, it's glaucoma, cataracts, and diabetes. And if we have time, I can go over a little bit of our 
work in Mexico where I do volunteer surgery every, every year. So this is an interesting graph that shows you back in 1900, hardly anybody lived past age 65. And now they're estimating that in the year 2030, uh, there'll be 70 million people in the United States over the age of 65. I guess that means we should all be investing in nursing homes and caregivers and stuff like that. <laughs> so uh, as we get older, the risk of eye diseases increases. So the eyes are actually pretty quiet and when we're young up to about age 40. So the only people that see doctors are people who are nearsighted or have astigmatism. And then at age 40, everybody needs reading glasses. So you either go to an eye doctor, an ophthalmologist, an optometrist, or you just go to the drugstore and buy your glasses. But uh, the, the thing we're going to talk about is what are the, the things that we can, we can see as we age? So one out of three patients over the age of 65 has some problem. So this picture here shows you a lower eyelid that's turned out. That's called an ectropion of the eyelid. It doesn't interfere with vision, it's just unsightly and annoying because the eye waters. So that's easy to fix by a plastic ophthalmic surgeon where they just tuck the, the muscles and get the lid back in proper position. So that's a fairly common thing. The eye can either turn out like this, this is called an ectropion, or it can turn in where the lashes rub against the cornea, that's called an entropion. But both of those are fixable with an outpatient procedure by a plastic ophthalmic surgeon. So this is another common thing. You can see the eyelids are drooping and the right eye of this gentleman is covering half of the pupil and the left eye is covering the upper part of the pupil. So if you have eyelid surgery just to make yourself look younger, that's called cosmetic surgery. This condition is called ptosis of the eyelid and it's covered by insurance companies and Medicare. So if you have a droopy eyelid, you can have it fixed and you can have Medicare or your insurance company pay for it because it's not considered cosmetic. It is considered functional. Now this is a tumor. I don't know if you can see my, my mouse here, but this is the opening to the tear duct and this is the tumor. This is a basal cell carcinoma. So basal cell carcinomas are the most common skin tumor. They occur around the face, they can occur on the back. People that had a lot of sunburns as a kid are prone to getting these. And if you're fair complected, wow. blue eyed and blonde like I was when I was a kid, I've had about 20 of these removed from different parts of my body. So basal cell tumors are another form of external eye disease that is treatable. And these are not malignant in the sense that they don't spread to other parts of the body and they can easily be removed. Now this is a miserable condition. Since you have, I think about 30 people in on this call, if any of you have ever had shingles, you can testify to how uncomfortable shingles is because it's an inflammation of the nerves. This is a bad form of it that affects the nerves to the face. So shingles is called herpes zoster is the medical term for it. You can get it along your back, you can get it on your chest on, and it affects just one half of the body. Just like in this, in this gentleman, you can see the lesions are all on the right side and right, if you go right up above his nose, the whole left side of his eye, of his eyelids and his forehead are normal. So that's a characteristic of herpes zoster. It affects one nerve root. So it affects, like if you had it on your back, it'd only be on one side of your back, but not the other side of the back. Now the good news for shingles is there's a vaccine for it. Uh, let me go to this one. So there's a new shingles vaccine called Shingrex, S-H-I-N-G-R-X is now available. This is significantly better than the old one, which was called Zostavax. And these, these injections can be vaccinated at most of the drugstores, you know, CVS and Rite Aid and places like that can do these. This takes two injections four months apart. So anybody over the age of 50 should consult with their medical doctor about the advisability of getting this. There are certain people where it can be a risky thing if you're immunocompromised, but most patients are candidate for this. And this pretty much gives you a 90% protection that you won't get the shingles vac virus or herpes zoster, and it'll save you a lot of trouble. So when you get the actual shingles, not only do you have pain while you're having the attack, the pain can last for years. You get an inflammation in the nerve called a neuralgia that can last for two or three years after you've had the acute phase. So it's something you don't want to get. So if you haven't yet had a shingrix, Vaccine, talk to your doctor or go to your pharmacist and see about getting it. I highly recommend I've had it. And even if you've had shingles in the past, 
my understanding is that this virus can come back even if you've had it before. And this Shingris vaccine can protect you from a subsequent attack as you get older. So that's a, that's a good tip to consider. Now we're gonna talk about things in the eye that can lead to loss of vision. And the number one is called age-related macular degeneration. Some of you may already have this or a form of it or know friends who have it. So this is very common. And by the time we're in our 90s, 15% of the population will have age-related macular degeneration. And you can do things to reduce the risk of it getting worse. And there's, there's two forms of it. Uh, one is called the dry form, and the other one is called uh, the wet form. So these are other causes, unoperated cataracts, glaucoma, and age-related macular degeneration. So this happens more often as we age, so hardly anybody has macular degeneration when they're 40, but you're more likely to have it as you get older, and as I said, by the time you're in your 90s, 15% of the population will have it. It's more common if you have a fair complexion, uh, blonde hair, blue eyes. If you have a family history, that increases your risk. And if you were ever a smoker, even as a kid, if you smoked a pack a day, you're at an increased risk of macular degeneration. So we all are at an increased risk because we're all hopefully going to keep getting older. But if you, if you were a heavy smoker, if you have a positive family history, you should definitely get your eyes checked and make sure you don't have any early signs of macular degeneration of the retina. So this is a picture of the retina, and you see these little yellow spots in the eye. The optic nerve is over here in the corner where you see this little yellow crescent right here. And these, these are called drusen, D-R-U-S-E-N. They're a sign of early macular degeneration of the retina. And if you have these drusen, the studies have shown that taking the vitamins that you see advertised on TV all the time will reduce the risk of this progressing. So there's three over-the-counter vitamins, Preserve Vision, Eye Caps, or Occuvite. And the one I take myself is Occuvite because my dad had this when he was 57. And it took 30 years for him to get worse before he couldn't drive or play golf anymore. So the vitamins can reduce the risk of progression. It's not a guarantee, but it's something that you can do that can help you protect your eyes as you get older. Now, uh, this is the atrophic or dry form. So the visual loss is gradual, and the drusen can progress as you get older. The wet form is called the exudative form of age-related macular degeneration, and it's due to an accumulation of fluid or blood in the center of the vision, which is the macula. The macula in the real eye is only about the size of a couple of pinheads, but it's the critical part of vision where all the light comes to a point focus. So in the wet form, the vitamins don't help very much, but there are injections and laser treatments available that can help reduce the progression of macular degeneration to the point where you can lose central vision. There's only one good thing about macular degeneration. You don't go blind like you do from retinitis pigmentosa. The guy that owns the casinos in Las Vegas, Steve Wynn, has retinitis pigmentosa. That means his entire retina is going and he's going to be totally blind eventually. With macular degeneration, you never lose your peripheral vision, just your central vision. So you can for sure re lose the ability to read and drive a car, but you'll always have some level of vision. So this is the symptoms. It's difficulty reading distortion, so straight lines would look crooked or bowed or curved. You can get a blind spot in the center but you'll maintain the peripheral vision. This is a test called an Amsler grid. If you want to do this test on yourself, you can do a Google search for Amsler, A-M-S-L-E-R grid. So when you look at the center of this dot, these lines should all look straight like a crossword puzzle. In macular degeneration, the lines would start looking wavy. So waviness of these lines on an Amsler grid are a sign of macular degeneration of the retina. And it's a simple test. You can do it yourself. You can just look at this grid like once a week with each eye separately and make sure that all the lines are straight. And that's pretty good assurance that your macula is in, in pretty good shape. It doesn't mean you don't have the drusen spots, though. The drusen can occur, and the Amsler grid test can be com completely normal. This is a fluorescein study, which means they injected a dye into your arm, and the circulation of the dye is taken in the retina. So all the white the blood vessels here, this is a, a, an artery with carrying the blood, and these white blotchy spots in the center 
are the leakage of fluid into the retina, which is the hallmark of the wet form of macular degeneration. So now there are injections that can be given into the eye that can dry this retina up and reduce the progression of visual loss and can actually sometimes cause the recovery of vision. So the wet form of macular degeneration is only 10% of all the cases. 90% of patients with macular degeneration have the dry form and they don't need the injection. So the injections sound kind of gruesome, but it actually don't hurt. It's a very fine needle and you wouldn't even feel it if it was injected into the back of your eye. So to minimize the effects of mac macular degeneration, monitor your vision with a grid, try to stop smoking, control any high blood pressure or diabetes, eat a diet that has lots of fruits and vegetables and take the antioxidant vitamins, which will prevent progression of the, especially the dry form of macular degeneration. Now the second most common cause of visual loss in the elderly is called glaucoma. Glaucoma is often called the thief in the night because it does not have any symptoms. You can have normal 20-20 vision and still have the beginning or even advanced glaucoma without even realizing you have it. There is a tendency for black patients to have this more commonly, just as blacks have more high blood pressure than Caucasians. So if, if you happen to be black, you're at a slightly increased risk in this. And uh, if I'm going too fast, we'll answer questions at the end. So uh, early detection of glaucoma is the key to treatment and the risk of getting glaucoma increases after age 40. So it's a simple test. So it's one reason why you shouldn't just buy reading glasses at the drugstore. You should go to an ophthalmologist or an optometrist and have your pressure checked to make sure that your pressure is normal. So these are the risk factors, advanced age, uh, family history of glaucoma is a factor, a little bit more common in diabetics and people with high blood pressure or people who are highly nearsighted. So uh, this is a picture of the optic nerves. The one on the right, you can see the little white area in the center of the nerve is very small. That means the nerve fibers are healthy, whereas the picture on the left, that white area called the cup of the nerve is wider and, and larger. So that would indicate if this is the same patient that there's a good probability of glaucoma occurring in this patient's right eye, but not, not yet damage in the left eye. So the most common cause is called open angle glaucoma. That's about 90% of them. And it's more common as we get older. And you can't detect it because in the early stages, you don't have any visual loss at all. You can have 20-20 vision and normal side vision. The other form of glaucoma is called angle closure. That's only 10% of the cases. And you get pain, redness of the eye, and there's a blockage of the outflow of fluid. This shows you a cross-section of the eye with the fluid that's made by the ciliary body here. It flows out around the iris into the drainage channel and uh, this is the most common form of glaucoma and it's treated just with drops or with lasers and in severe cases, sometimes surgery. You wanna prevent further nerve damage so the medications lowers the pressure and reduces the chances of you having an increase in loss of vision as you get older. This other picture shows you a blockage. So the blockage occurs in the periphery where the, the space between the iris and the cornea is narrow. It's called narrow angle glaucoma. And this, the good thing about narrow angle glaucoma is you get a red eye like this eye, you can see the blood vessels are all dilated. The pupil is mid dilated. That's because the pressure has raised the high enough that it causes damage to the muscle that constricts the pupil. So a painful red eye with halos and, and, and rainbow effects and a dilated pupil might indicate narrow angle glaucoma and that's treated with a laser to create an opening in the iris and that usually cures this condition. So um, the third uh, most common cause of visual loss is basically uh, cataract formation. So here's a dilated pupil and this black area in the center here is the plaque that's right in the center of the pupil. This would cause a significant decrease in vision where the patient probably couldn't even see the large E on a chart. So the good thing about having a cataract, it's the most successful operation performed on the body. So uh, if you have cataracts, don't worry, you can have vision restored and often better than you had before. 
because with modern implants, we can correct astigmatism, we can correct farsightedness, we can put an implant in the eye that corrects the vision like a bifocal so you can eliminate glasses completely. So cataract surgery is highly successful at rehabilitating the patients with cataracts. So the timing of the cataract surgery is based on your visual needs. So for example, if you're a pilot and you need perfect 20-20 vision, you might have early cataract surgery, whereas a patient that has Alzheimer's disease is in a rest home, they can have significant loss of vision because they don't need a lot of good vision just to see the food on their plate and to be mobile, to be able to walk through a doorway, for example. So sometimes cataracts can take 10 or 15 years to progress to the point where it's justified in removing the cataracts. So the cataract surgery, first we can usually change glasses and improve the vision. And then this is how the cataract is removed. So it's not vaporized like a laser, like magic. There's a little device called the fequimulsification probe. This has a suction thing and the cataract is, is pulverized. This is kind of like a miniature, miniature jackhammer. And once the cloudy lens is removed, it's replaced with an artificial lens called the lens implant. So everybody that has cataract surgery gets a lens implant. And the standard lens implant just corrects the vision but doesn't correct astigmatism or for, for reading. But if you pay extra out-of-pocket expenses, you can get rid of reading glasses and you can get rid of astigmatism by having a, what's called a premium lens implant placed inside your eye. So this is what an implant looks inside the eye. Here's the pupil. This upper part is the curvature of the cornea and this is the lens implant placed in the bag of the capsule. So we've been using lens implants since 1975. So it's highly successful surgery. It's done under local anesthesia. You just have drops in your eyes. You're not put to sleep. And it's very successful procedure that many of you have probably already had already. I know Tom has. So over 90% of patients with cataract surgery can get 20-40 vision or even better. Now it's actually closer to 95% get 20-40 and almost 90% get at least 20-20. <clears throat> Infections are rare but possible. The rate of infection with a cataract operation is about one in 3,000 cases. It's rare to get glaucoma. It's possible to get a detached retina that has to be repaired. So there's no operation that's 100% risk-free, but this is among the safest operations performed on the body. The bottom one shows a rare complication where you can get a clouding of the membrane behind the implant, and that's fixed with a laser in the office and is also highly successful. So the fourth leading cause of visual loss as we get older is diabetes. And there are two forms of diabetes. Childhood diabetes is more serious and usually requires insulin and they're more likely to have retinal complications. Mm -hmm. The typical diabetic as an adult is usually not quite as serious. It's usually treated without insulin and there are pills that can monitor the diabetes. So you just are monitored three or four times a day, three or four times a, a year by your doctor and most type two diabetics do well, and they don't usually have serious complications. This shows you the kind of complications you can get. I'll be finished in 10 minutes. Okay, so this is a, an exudation of fluid in the center of the retina. This is the optic nerve here. This is a leakage of fluid in the diabe diabetic. This would be treated with lasers or with injections, and the loss of vision is very rare now as a complication of diabetes. These are abnormal blood vessels. All these extra blood vessels are not supposed to be there. These abnormal blood vessels tend to leak and can, can cause hemorrhaging. And this is usually treated with lasers or injections. Do we have five more minutes or do you want me to quit? Yes, you're fine. Okay, so this is the surgery that we do in Mexico. It's called Flying Doctors of Mercy. So we fly to El Fuerte, Mexico on small private planes from small airports around Los Angeles. And we take care of the Mexican population. In Mexico, they don't have Medicare and Medicaid. So the patients are dependent on charity surgery. So this is mission surgery, it's called. So El Fuerte is right here. Here's the Baja Peninsula. Here's the Sea of Cortez. So El Fuerte is in mainland Mexico. So we fly down to the, I go down there once a year, but the clinic runs several months during the year. 
We fly down on Thursdays, operate on Fridays and Saturdays, and come home on Sundays. So this is the kind of thing that we run into. There's hundreds and hundreds of patients would like to be seen. They come from little farms all around the El Fuerte area. And uh, this is my friend, Dr. Villasenor, who started this clinic about 15 years ago, screening patients. This is the kind of cataract we don't see in the United States because it would be removed. It's a white pupil. This is a dense cataract, and this is what it looks like when it's taken out. It's like a little black rock. So that's the kind of surgery that we primarily do is cataract surgery. Uh, this is a little different in Mexico. We have four operating tables in the same operating room. We don't do that in the United States for sterility reasons, but it's for it's to allow us to do more surgery in Mexico. This is one of our technicians assisting two different doctors at the same time. So the surgery is highly successful. And there are volunteers from all over the United States that fly to this clinic in El Fuerte that do the surgeries with us. Now, this was an interesting case that I'll never forget. This was a, a pediatric ophthalmologist from Wisconsin operated on this boy. So you can see in this picture on the left, his eye is elevated, it's higher, and it's asymmetrical. You can imagine a young kid in school, young kids, would, kids can be mean, so his classmates probably made fun of his positions of his eyes. So he was born without a muscle to, that would help to pull the eye down. So the surgeon from Wisconsin transposed the muscle from the outer part of the eye and the inner part and sewed it in down here. And the next day his eyes were straight. Aww. So this is, this is an interesting place to go, but we don't suffer very much. This is the hotel where <laughs> we, they have a nice restaurant. So we have good food and and uh, we pay for our own trip down there we buy the gas for the private planes that the pilots that fly us down there we pay for our own meals and we do the surgery and examine the patients free there's a nice little catholic church in the village uh, you can go to church on saturday and uh they have a nice pastors the other thing that i did one on one of my trips i went to visit copper canyon mexico the copper canyon mexico is larger than the grand canyon we stayed at this hotel, the Posada Mirador Hotel, and the hotel is built on the cliffs on the edge of the canyon. This is the canyon in the background. So it's an interesting little side trip that's available to us. So that's the presentation and, and the plug for our charity surgery work. Now, I'd be happy to answer any questions, either written questions or if you can ask me questions, I can, I try to cover a lot of material in a short period of time, so I hope I didn't go too fast. Could you, could, uh, Dr. Sulz, could you un, un, unshare your screen, please? Uh, if I can figure out how to do that, let's oh. see. <laughs> <laughs> if not, don't worry about it. If not, don't worry about it. Does anybody have any questions? I Janice, do. are you raising your, oh, John, you're raising your hand. John O'Keefe? Okay. Can I ask my question? Sure. Yeah, Dr. Sulz, John O'Keefe. Uh, you talked about cataract surgery. 90% uh, of the people have it achieve 2040 vision or better. Well, if you get 2040 vision, you're still going to need glasses, aren't you? Uh, you well, still no, 20, 2040 would mean they get 2040 vision, but they might need glasses to get the 2040 vision. In the old days of cataract surgery, the formulas that we use for the implant power weren't as good as they are now. So the percentage of patients that get better than 2040 with glasses is higher now. It's closer to 95 to 98 percent. I see. But the, the driver's test requirement in California is you have to have 2040 vision either with or without glasses to get a dri driver's license. Okay. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. How about statistics on achieving 2020 vision after cataract surgery? Any statistics on that? Yeah, it's pretty good. It, that takes a healthy retina, and because we're operating on some patients in their 80s or 90s, sometimes they're limited as to how much vision that they get. But if you have a healthy retina, it's probably 98% of the <coughs> patients will, will achieve, achieve 20, 20 vision, but it might take glasses to get them the final 2020 vision if the power of the implant is slightly off. I see Phil. I see Phil Gabriel's hand. Phil, do you have a question? Hi, hi, hi Doctor. Thanks for sharing your wisdom. Um, the the uh, vitamins you talked about. Do you think it's worthwhile to start taking those? I've been I've been on them for about three or four years now. Do you, yeah, do you, do you well, see it, a real it, benefit? It's a very in taking vitamins? interesting question. 
the studies that were done that showed vitamin therapy can help us with macular degeneration were done over 15 years ago. So they were done on people who had early signs of macular degeneration. Now, an unanswered question is if you're just 60, say, and you don't have any sign of macular degeneration, do the vitamins prevent you from getting it? They've never done that study. So that, that they would have to do with thousands of patients that have normal eyes, normal retinas, put half of them on vitamins and half of them on sugar pills, follow them for 10 years to find out. Boy. I can tell you for sure, it doesn't hurt you to take them. And the brand names, if you want to try to protect yourself, are Ocuvite, O-C-U-V-I-T-E, ICAP, spelled with an I, C-A-P-S, or Preserve Vision. Those are all available in the pharmacies over the counter in the eye section. And it won't hurt you to take one every day. That might protect you, but we don't have solid science behind that. Good to know. Thank you. Appreciate it. Does anybody else have a question for uh, Dr. Sauls? Nancy, hi. it's Steve. It's Steve Day. Uh, hi, doctor, Steve. Thank, hi, uh, doctor. Thank you for the presentation. It's very interesting. Um, if you happen to be looking at me right now, on the, I am on your image. You notice that I have something called strabismus. My eyes wander. Well, strabismus means the eyes don't focus together, so the eyes can deviate inward, which is called esotropia. They can de deviate outward, which is called exotropia. Or one eye can be higher than the other, like the Mexican boy that I showed. Any of well, those I, are business. Yeah. So the eyes yeah. don't track together. Right. Well, I can control it. I can focus on an image, and then I, if my, especially when I get tired or later in the day, they kind of wander off sometimes. Is it, yeah, having an extra glass of having an extra glass of wine makes them wander off more too. <laughs> <laughs> For what you said. I'm sure, you know, I, as a child, I used to do exercises, not very diligently. And, you know, I, it seems like in more recent years, it's gotten more serious. I, and I don't want to make this into a, a consult, so I apologize for that. But maybe you can share your thoughts about strabismus. Well, you, ha you have never had surgery so far? No, I've had consults over the years, uh, but never actual surgery, no. Yeah, I don't, I used to do that surgery as a resident, but I don't do that anymore. But I can give you the name of a very good, a uh, pediatric ophthalmologist who also does adults, he can mm -hmm. give you an opinion about whether you should think. So if you're having more and more trouble controlling it, it's probably your uh -huh. eyes probably turn out when I wanders out usually. Well, I can, you, make it, I can make it so either does, but. but yeah, so yeah. if you can hold it straight most of the time and you're rarely having trouble, you probably wouldn't want to operate. If you're having more trouble controlling it because exotropia tends to get worse as we age, you could get an opinion from his Dr. Ken Wright, W-R-I-G-H-T. His office is in Beverly Hills on San Vicente. He's a very good ophthalmologist. He's done very complicated cases, but he, he usually does kids. So if you go see him, you'll be the only adult in the office. You'll be with a bunch of little kids. Okay. But he'll tell you whether you, you should have surgery or not. Appreciate that. Thank you so much. Appreciate that. Jim. Jim Sauls. Hey, Tom. You Jim Sauls. Is Jim Sauls there? Yeah, go ahead. Jim, this is Steve Shearer. Yeah, I know. I'm almost finished. Jim, Jim, this is Steve Shearer, and that was an excellent presentation, and I was wondering how your golf is. <laughs> hey, Steve. <laughs> My golf game for sure has not gotten better. <laughs> oh. <laughs> That's all, Jim. That's all I got for you. Hey, that was good. Good to, see, good to see you, Steve. Good to see you, too. Jim, Even Jim, virtually. I had a Jim, I had a question. You made reference okay, to, uh, uh, I have astigmatism, and you made reference to astigmatism could be corrected through surgery, but I thought there was nothing you could do for astigmatism. No, astigmatism can be corrected in three ways. With glasses is the most common way, with contact lenses, with LASIK surgery, or with cataract surgery. But to correct astigmatism with cataract surgery, you have to pay about $2,500 out of pocket <laughs> for a premium lens implant. So, so Medicare doesn't care that you don't want to wear glasses. They pay for standard cataract surgery, but not to correct astigmatism. So if you have a cataract and you have astigmatism, you can consider taking the cataract out with a premium implant and your astigmatism will be corrected by the implant. 
I had a question for the doctor. Go ahead. This is Ed Gold. <clears throat> the, uh, with respect to macular degeneration, uh, are there any cures for it? For example, I came across a country, a, a company called Occutrix, and it has augmented reality where they have uh, low vision correction and surgery visualization. Are you aware of that company? Yeah, what you're talking about is if you have significant macular degeneration and you can't see well, you, there is no really no cure for that. You can control it, but you can magnify the image with, with spectacle glasses first. And if that's not enough, you can use specialized glasses. And there are even low vision TV sets that you can use. You can put the reading material under a TV camera and blow it up on a, on a large monitor and enlarge it so you can see it. So those are visual aids that can, it's not a cure, it's just a way of magnifying the letters so you can see them better. Thank you. I Any other question. questions for Dr. Sells? I, I have a question. Chris. Uh, this is Chris Gaynor. One of our former Rotary Scholars uh, is an ophthalmologist and went to Duke University. And he's now practicing up in Yuba City, California. What's his, his name? Pranav Amin. Okay. I was wondering if you ever run across him. No, but I like the fact that he went to Duke. <laughs> okay. Yes, that's good to know. Dr. Sauls, thank you so much for your time and wealth of valuable information. In well, honor of the time you have given us today, we are going to be making a donation in your name to the Westwood branch of the Los Angeles Public Library. We great. hope that you'll join us again. There's obviously, this is a great turnout. We have, last time I looked, 33 uh, participants here. So a lot of interest in what you had to say. Thank you again. And if you could, I'm looking at a black screen, which everyone else, do you see a button on your screen that says stop sharing? It's probably red. Yeah, I do. If you would please, yes, excellent. I, thank you. I just said it. <laughs> thank you. Well, well I want to thank you for having me. I hope I can come live to a meeting because I like your lunches. <laughs> oh, we hope so too. We feel exactly the same way that you do. <laughs> well, thanks for, thanks for having me virtually. It was fun. Oh, it Appreciate was fun you, and, and very Thank worthwhile for us Thank you, to do. Thank you. Okay. Thank you all for being here. Thank you for our visiting Rotarians for joining us. We greatly appreciate you. your, your time and attention.